In the headlines, Korea's political deadlock continues over a special bill aimed at investigating the April Fair disaster. The main opposition party demands they go for a three-way consultative body with family members of the victims. Torrential rain wreaks havoc in southern parts of Korea, causing landslides and a shutdown of the 42 nuclear reactor. We have the damage report. And a magnitude 6.0 earthquake hit northern California, injuring at least 170 people and causing destruction in the largest tremor to rock the Bay Area in 25 years. Happy Monday, everyone. Live from Seoul, this is Primetime News, and I'm Sean Lin. Welcome to the program. I'm Kang Chedi. Hope uh, you've been able to stay out of the rain because the weather here in Korea turned tragic on this Monday. We begin with a damage report out of uh, the southern parts of the country hit by torrential rain. A bus was swept away and submerged by floodwaters in the city of Changwon in Gyeongsang Namdo province killing one person so far, and we have separate reports of two more deaths in other accidents. Subway operations have been partially suspended in the region, and some roads closed off too, and a nuclear power plant in Busan had to be manually shut down after it was partially flooded by rainwater. No immediate threats of a radiation leak have been detected, according to the Korea Hydro and Nuclear Power Corporation. And we're getting even more rain in the southern parts of the country. And uh, for more uh, weather updates, we are joined by Kim bo -kyung at the Weather Center. So we are getting more downpours. Yes, that's right. Uh, more precipitation is expected. So if you're in the affected regions, be prepared for possible landslides and flooding. So far, nearly 271 millimeters have fallen in Changwon of Gyeongsang Namdo province, while Busan got up to 242 millimeters today alone. Now, all of this is due to cold air from the north colliding with hot and humid air from the south leading to heavy downpours. Some relief though as rain clouds which dropped over 100 millimeters of precipitation per hour have now lift, uh, moved out while heavy rainfall advisories have been lifted. But due to winds blowing from the east we are expecting more rainfall. Both Gyeongsangdo provinces as well as parts of Gangwondo province are looking at up to 50 millimeters while 10 to 5 to 10, that is, is expected for parts of Jeolla Pukdo and Chungcheong Pukdo provinces. Be safe on the roads and make sure to tune in for future weather updates. All right, uh, Po Kyung, thank you very much for that. And in other news of the day, political deadlock still persists here in Korea over a special bill to probe the April ferry sinking that killed more than 300 people. The ruling party has repeatedly rejected the opposition's proposal to include the bereaved families in negotiations. Will Korea's two main political parties ever find a way to loosen up this political logjam? Choi yoo tells us more. After the ruling party quickly rejected her proposal to invite the victims' families to negotiate the so-called Sewolho Ferry Bill, opposition floor leader Park Young Sun has given an ultimatum to the ruling party to agree to the three-way talks by Monday. The tripartite consultation, including the family representatives, would garner the family's consent and public sympathy. We will fight so long as the ruling party rejects the three-way talks. The ruling side did not budge. We need to think about what precedent would be set having the stakeholders participate in negotiations under a representative democracy. The ferry victims' families are demanding that a probe committee, which includes lawyers and legal experts selected by the families themselves, have the authority to investigate and indict. The ruling party says that would destroy the principle of criminal law. And so the Senuri party floor leaders meeting with the victims' families bore no fruit on Monday, with the two sides only confirming their differences. The months-long political discord has left parliament in paralysis, with a lineup of major economy and reform-related bills kept in limbo. 
Ruling party leader Kim Musong on Monday urged the opposition to work towards swift passage of the economic bills that are closely linked to the people's livelihoods. If the rival parties fail to break the impasse by Monday, it will not only further dampen President Park's economic and reform drive, but start a domino effect of delaying the parliament's government audit and budget planning for next year. Che Yusun, Arirang News. North Korea hasn't test-fired any missiles for well over a week now, and watchers say Pyongyang most likely wants to avoid upsetting Seoul ahead of the upcoming Asian Games, which will be held in the South Korean city of Incheon, with North Korean athletes in attendance. Our Son Jong-in has more on the North's two sides. Two days before Seoul and Washington kicked off their annual two-week Ulji Freedom Guardian exercise, the North Korean military began making threats. If we decide South Korea's small and big military bases will turn into a sea of fire and a heap of ashes. Pyongyang has long denounced the drills as a rehearsal for an invasion of the North. But since it fired five short-range rockets into the East Sea on August 14th, the North has shown some restraint. Instead, it has proposed talks to discuss logistics for its athletes and cheering squad at the upcoming Incheon Asian Games. The North Korea proposed talks on the practical issues related to the Asian Games through an exchange of letters. Experts view the North's latest contradictory moves of threats and offers of dialogue as a typical stick and carrot strategy. As opposed to their threatening remarks and written words, I think the North will propose more dialogue in the future to send its delegation to the Asian Games. Many experts believe inter-Korean talks will resume after the joint drills are over, but most agree it will be difficult to attain many tangible results on issues such as holding family reunions and resuming tours to North Korea's Mount Gumgang Resort. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. The North Korea issue will take center stage at a meeting between U.S. President Barack Obama and Chinese President Xi Jinping at an upcoming summit of Asia-Pacific leaders. This is according to Robert Wang, a senior diplomat at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. He told China's Global Times that the two leaders will discuss the North's nuclear weapons program and other issues regarding the Korean Peninsula at a bilateral meeting on the sidelines of November's APEC summit in Beijing. Your gateway to the day's biggest stories in Korea and around the world. Breaking news, the hottest interviews, and a whole lot more. Join Arirang Sean Lim and Kang Chedi from the heart of Seoul. News begins now. Primetime news, weeknights, live at 10 on Arirang TV. In today's fiercely competitive retail market, Korea's department stores are doing all they can to lure in shoppers. And one of the newest strategies targets a specific group of consumers, designating an entire section just for them. Hwang Jia tells us more. From suits, shirts, and briefcases to shoes and golf accessories, this section of a mall has just about everything a man would want to buy at a department store. It's called an exclusive area for men. In the past, I had to go from floor to floor looking for things, but here they have everything I need, so it's very convenient. With a growing number of male customers taking their wallets to local department stores, marketing teams have decided to set aside a zone just for them. Sales from male shoppers has been rising steadily over recent years, with the figure jumping more than 30 percent each year since 2011. The exclusive sections have been a popular draw not just for men, but for other segments of the population as well. Long rows of dried pollocks attract mothers looking for dinner items. This corner in a liquor store is dedicated solely to Korean traditional drinks. Here, shoppers can find any and all kinds of local alcoholic beverages. I am delighted to see all kinds of local drinks here, especially these days when Korean traditional drinks have lost some of their customers to foreign brands. Sales managers explain that the move has helped them raise sales and drop prices as they're able to make direct deals with producers. By operating a differentiated service, we provide not only something to see, but also cheaper prices. We are getting good reviews from customers. 
Amid increased competition among department stores, they're encouraging customers to open up their wallets through this unique form of marketing. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Korea's largest auto group appears to be losing ground in the domestic market right here in Korea. According to the Korea Automobile Manufacturers Association, the combined market share of Hyundai Motor and its sister brand Kia Motors stood at 69.5% during the first half of this year. It's the first time in seven years that the figure fell below 70%. This comes on the back of the increased presence of imported cars, accounting for 12.4% of the market share in the first half, which is a nearly threefold increase compared to 2007. And here's a pattern that many Koreans won't like to hear about, but a new study shows that people here work the second longest hours in the OECD. Koreans work an average of 2,163 hours last year. That's about 45 hours a week, falling second only to Mexico. From the, two year, uh, from the year 2000 to 2007, Korea actually ranked number one until being overtaken by Mexico back in 2008. The country with the least number of working hours is the Netherlands with under 30 hours a week. In this week's Industry Insight, we're going to talk about some of the challenges facing Korea's tech startups. Here we are in one of the most wired countries in the world, but as our Connie Kim says, there are a number of cultural factors that can give young up-and-coming entrepreneurs a hard time. Facebook, Yahoo, Apple. These are just a few of big names that started out small in Silicon Valley. Their big ideas eventually reached consumers, but only after the right financial backers came along. Well, here in Korea, things can be a bit tougher for startups. 1,500 Silicon Valley tech companies raised 25 billion U.S. dollars last year. The total for Korea-based startups? A mere six one hundredths of that. But here's an example of Shaker Media, a video-creating company that's beat this tough environment with the right idea. Take a look. Making memories last is what Shaker Media does. With its instant video creating platform, Shaker makes dragging and dropping simple and creating professional quality videos easier. Uh, I think of video as the most powerful storytelling medium. Uh, you know, when you and I are here face to face talking, uh, that's a powerful storytelling medium. And so I thought that it would be necessary and desirable for many people, everyone, not just the people with the big production uh, budgets and the fancy expensive mm -hmm. cameras mm -hmm. uh, to be able to do video, but for everyone to do great video. It also helps small businesses advertise in a way helping the Park Geun-hye administration's creative economy drive and search for fresh, innovative ideas for growth engines. Video ads have three times the click-through rate of mobile advertisements. Mm -hmm. uh, they are effective. But small businesses just couldn't participate because they couldn't afford to spend 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars on producing a beautiful video advertisement. Born three years ago, Shaker now serves customers all throughout Asia and the Americas, having raised about three million U.S. dollars as of May this year. So I know it's quite tough for Korean venture companies to get investment. Where did where did you get the investment from? There is a lot of venture capital available here in Korea today. Uh, angel investors are very active. We've also raised money from uh, Facebook executives. Uh, we've also raised money from Korea's largest internet company, NHN Investment, and Korea's largest steel company, POSCO Investment. But that's not the reality for the majority of startups in Korea. Having to break ground on the back of financial guarantees or loans can turn off a lot of young entrepreneurs especially in a business environment where investing through M&As is not as prevalent as it is in, say, the United States. But Lee says Korea is still a good market to try out new ideas as long as young entrepreneurs utilize a strong IT infrastructure and low entry barrier for startups in the country. There is a vibrant local market here in Korea, an incredible test bed to test your ideas with a very receptive uh, local market that's ready to try new things. Connie Kim, Arirang News. 
And staying with tech entrepreneurship, with the growing popularity of Korea's mobile games market, stocks and domestic mobile games firms are skyrocketing. And with it, more new stockholders in their 30s and 40s are being born. According to a data by the Financial Supervisory Service on Monday, mobile game publisher Gameville CEO Song Byung Chun's stock value reached over 230 million U.S. dollars as of last Friday. That's a rise of 147 million dollars just this year thanks to a 200 percent jump in the company stock at the start of the first half. Leaders of rival companies like We Made and Sunday Taz also saw their shares increase significantly. The rise in mobile game stocks are being attributed to improved market sentiment on overall solid profits from the industry. In the U.S., the governor of uh, California has declared a state of emergency after a massive earthquake shook the San Francisco Bay Area earlier on a Sunday morning. So we go to our Paul Yee at the News Center. Paul, emergency services there say they've been overwhelmed in the aftermath. How widespread is the damage? Well, reports say the 6.0 magnitude earthquake sent powerful tremors throughout northern California, hitting the Napa Wine Valley the hardest. At least 172 people have been injured, thousands left without power, and water and gas lines ruptured. Though the fires have been put out, authorities are now bracing for the next round of aftershocks in the coming weeks. Our Shin Semin reports. The strongest quake to hit California in a quarter century saw scores of people hospitalized, caused houses to burst into flames, and damaged scores of buildings in California's Napa Valley. A 6.0 magnitude earthquake rocked California's wine country at around 3.20 a.m. on Sunday local time with the epicenter less than 10 kilometers southwest of Napa. The earthquake was felt over a huge portion of California in San Francisco, but the most powerful tremors were recorded in Napa and Sonoma County. More than 30 aftershocks followed the quake, according to the U.S. Geological Survey. Officials at Queen of the Valley Medical Center in Napa say at least six people have been critically injured, with 120 less seriously hurt. California Governor Jerry Brown has declared a state of emergency and said state officials were working closely with state and local emergency managers, first responders, and transportation officials. California is not a safe zone when it comes to earthquakes, as it sits right above the Pacific's ring of fire, where earthquakes and volcanic eruptions occur often. In 1906, San Francisco was struck by 7.8 magnitude quake that killed over 3,000 people and destroyed 80 percent of the city. In 1989, another powerful quake hit in a similar area, killing more than 60 and injuring hundreds. Shin Semin, Arirang News. And as the world fights back against the deadly outbreak in Ebola in Africa, while well, switching gears, a fresh political crisis has hit the country in France as President Francois Hollande dissolves the government following an ugly feud over the country's economy. On Monday, Prime Minister Emmanuel Valls offered the government's resignation, this after he publicly accused economic, economic minister Arnaud Montebourg for, quote, crossing the line in a recent newspaper interview. Montebourg had reportedly slammed the government's handling of the economy, in particular austerity measures which he said were holding back France's growth. According to the Le Mans newspaper, he also criticized Germany for being trapped by a policy of austerity and urged his fellow socialist members to change course. The remarks quickly drew fierce criticism within the leadership and raised concerns of internal government conflict. The presidential office has not directly commented on the political feud, but issued a statement that a new cabinet would be formed by Tuesday, one that would have a consistent direction. And as the world fights back against a deadly outbreak of Ebola in West Africa, a new strain has turned up in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Congolese health minister, Felix Numbi, confirmed two fatal cases of Ebola on Monday in an isolated area in the north of the country. The infectious fever has already killed 13 people there as the government orders quarantine measures to contain the spread of the virus. This epidemic doesn't have any link to that which is now happening in West Africa. And it's the seventh epidemic in the Democratic Republic of Congo since the outbreak in Yambuku in 1976 in the same equator province. 
The deadly fever has killed over 1,400 people this year, most of them some from Sierra Leone, Liberia, Guinea, and Nigeria, making it the worst Ebola outbreak on record. And finally, the new Prime Minister of Thailand, Prayut Chan O Cha, has received a royal endorsement as the military leader further solidifies his grip of power on the country. The approval from King Bui Pol Abdulaje is widely considered a formality, but it is expected to give Prayuth a boost in public support after the military seized control of the government back in May. The army chief was appointed prime minister by an uncontested vote in the National Assembly last week. Prayuth promised on Monday to form an interim government in the coming weeks, although the power is likely to remain firmly in the junta's hands. He added that he wants to free Thailand from a vicious cycle of political instability, but critics say his rhetoric, including references to agricultural utopia, is outdated and threatens to drag the company, the country rather, back by decades. And that wraps up a look at international stories making headlines around the world. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Hello and welcome to sports. Now it was a big weekend for sports around the world, but in Korea, none was bigger than South Korea winning the Little League World Series crown in the U.S. SJ Lee has more on their first championship win since 1985. Call them the Little Giants of baseball because the South Korean Little League squad finished off their incredible run at the 2014 Little League World Series by beating the U.S. champions Jackie Robinson West of Illinois. After defeating Japan for the second time in this tournament over the weekend, the South Korean Little Leaguers, who represented the Asia-Pacific region, played a game full of emotion and vigor. Che Chan's brilliant pitching performance as a reliever and a four-run sixth inning helped South Korea beat Jackie Robinson West 8-4 to claim their first Little League World Series title in 29 years and their third title overall. For these Little Leaguers, they celebrated like young kids that they are, but played the entire tournament like big leaguers. SJ Lee, Arirang News. Now what a great moment for the kids and I hope they enjoy every moment of it, but now that takes us to the big boys in the KBO. It's Monday's matchup between the Hanwha Eagles and the Kia Tigers. Now it's a makeup game for the rainout on Sunday. And for Hanwha, it's Andrew Albers throwing. For Kia, it's Im Jun Sop. Now we go to the first inning. Im loads the bases, then Felix Pia doubles. Then we go to the next batter. Kim Taewon brings to home. It's 4 0 Eagles. And we fast forward to the sixth. Now Pia is feeling it and he slams one over the wall for two scores. Then in the eighth, it's Kim. He also homers. Now, meanwhile, Albers is fantastic throwing a complete game, giving up just three hits while striking out six. And Hanwha takes it nine to nothing. Now to golf first with the ladies. Korea's own Yu Soyeon finally ended her winless drought after two years, taking home the Canadian Pacific Women's Open trophy. Finishing at 23 under par, Yu not only beat out fellow Koreans Chen Ayeon and Park Bi, who finished second and third, but also set the tournament record. Now we go on to the men at the Barclays. It was Hunter Mahan on fire for the last round, earning him his sixth career PGA victory. Now the FedEx Cup playoffs continue on this week with the Deutsche Bank Championship. And finally, ending with the Pan Pacific Swimming Championships in Australia. Korea's marine boy Park Tae-hwan was named the best swimmer of the meet after winning the 400-meter freestyle on Saturday. Now the win is his third 400-meter gold in a row at the Pan Pacifics, which is held every four years, and it was good enough for the MVP nod. The event is seen as the dress rehearsal for the Asian Games next month, where he'll defend his one, two, and 400-meter freestyle golds. And that wraps it up for now. This has been Stephen Che. I'll see you later with more sports updates. And that's primetime news for this Monday. I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for watching. And I'm Kang Teddy. Have a great evening, everyone. We'll see you soon.